Hi, everyone. I'm Pragya Sabu. I work as a product manager at a healthcare company in New York. And I also run my nonprofit called Project 21 in India, which focuses on providing holistic education to the youth. I graduated from Georgia Tech in 2017 with a degree in industrial and systems engineering. Today, I'd like to speak about adopting principles of system thinking and design thinking to solve complex and daily problems. Most people think that you can either employ a systems thinking approach or a design thinking approach to solve a problem and that both these approaches are mutually exclusive of each other. But in my experience as an engineer and a product manager, a good balance of both these approaches have yielded the most positive results. As engineers over here, we've had the privilege to imbibe principles of systems thinking quite naturally, but most of us have confined the use of these principles to only solving problems in class or in your textbook or at your workplace. But before I delve any further, I'd like to define what systems thinking is and what design thinking is and how these two concepts actually blend together. So what is systems thinking? A system could be an organization or a macro problem domain. It relies on two very critical facets the underlying structure and the relationship that each individual component shares with each other. The system contains interdependencies of the events and the data, which can be analyzed to understand the basic trends and the pattern. With systems thinking, the fundamental concept is to identify the holistic perspective of the entire system to find the root cause of the problem. It's commonly known as an iceberg model with four levels. The first one being events, followed by patterns, followed by structures, and finally mental models. This indicates that the piece of information above the surface is only a single event, and in other words, a mask for the real issue. To gain an increased leverage for solving the problem affecting the entire system, there's a need to understand the system as a whole and all levels submerged below the tip of the iceberg. It's also useful to move up and down the underlying levels and improve the model throughout the process. Some examples of system thinking. Treating your body as one system whose parts interact. So for example, if you have a stomach disorder and you want to take a medicine that improves your stomach condition, you want to make sure the medicine doesn't impact other parts of your body harmfully. Second example, treating the employees of a company as a part of an integrated whole. For example, in a hospital, a physician is no more important than a janitor as all of these two components work together to ensure the hospital is fully functioning and providing the best care it can for the patient. Moving over to design thinking. Design thinking is an iterative process in which the goal is to empathize with the user to gain user insights, break common notions and challenge visions that are usually taken for granted, define the problem using lateral thinking strategies, ideate on the defined problems, and finally, release a minimum viable product as a prototype to the user base and establish a feedback loop which allows the product creator to test the prototype and take feedback to ideate more and more each time. This process is always evolving and the key to design thinking lies truly in getting a deep understanding of the user's needs while keeping your biases aside. The other critical component of design thinking is questioning each and every assumption that is taken for granted. Now I've kind of explained what systems thinking is and what design thinking is. I'd like to walk through the process of design thinking where each step in the design thinking process is integrated with the systems thinking philosophy. I will be explaining how this is of use in the day-to-day -day life of an engineer or a designer or a product manager and at the same time draw parallels as to how you can use this approach in your personal life to solve daily problems. The design thinking steps are integrated with the systems thinking fundamentals and you should consider this whole system as a in its unity and not in isolation. Each step has an underlying systems thinking philosophy which can enhance the results 
yielded by the design thinking. The first step in design thinking is empathy and understanding the user. As a product manager, as an engineer, as a designer, we spend a lot of time trying to understand what our users actually want. And we do a lot of user research for that. Product managers, like other humans, tend to have biases within themselves as well. And it's very difficult to keep these biases aside and make sure that they don't influence what the user insights actually say. So for this reason, we define research plans that are free flowing and non prescriptive. If when you want to use this approach in your personal life, let's say you've identified yourself to be maybe unhappy at your current job and that's a problem that you want to solve. How would you approach this problem from understanding the user's needs perspective? So the first step is to get very critical to understand the root of the problem before jumping into the solution. Most of these needs are identified by asking the right questions, mainly questions you've not asked yourself before. For instance, if you're not happy at your job, your instant reflex reaction may be that I should find a different job and I should quit this job. But the truth is, maybe you don't like this job because you prefer working as a freelancer or an entrepreneur, or because you don't like your job as you're not qualified as, as you should be and you may, get, may spend your time better at qualifying more skills instead. So another way to understand the user in this case, which is yourself, I'm gonna take a system thinking approach for that and to analyze yourself from end to end. Take a journal and start reflecting on your day. Ask yourself new and difficult questions you've not asked yourself before. And that'll help you understand what your true needs are. Another example could be taking a time sheet, marking off 30 minute slots through the day and actually filling in what you did in those 30, 30, 30 minute slots versus what you actually intended to do. When you start observing this over a period of time, you'll realize that there's a lot of things that you've uncovered about yourself which you didn't actually before. So the reason that you may uncover is that maybe you'd spend a lot of time reinforcing negative talks about your job and that is why the reason you don't actually enjoy your job. So after you do this for a period of time and you start figuring out behavioral patterns, you'll end up understanding yourself better. A few questions you can ask yourself are, did I work out the day I had a productive work day? How much caffeine did I have the day I had a productive work day? Did I actually eat the right nutrition or the right meal the day I had the most productive work day? And so on and so forth. The next step could be to visualize your problem and put them on a Venn diagram or a flowchart or a graph. As PMs, we tend to do that with all the user insights we gather and it really helps us understand what the themes and trends are. It can help you solve the most complex of the problems and also the most micro level problems and it helps the creative thinkers better interpret nuances and data and trends. So that's step number one. Step number two is defining the problem. As product managers, once we have the user insight and the empathy developed, we start defining the problem. It's important to know that the right definition of the problem is the only way to get the right answer to the problem. If the requirements, constraints, and the problems are defined inaccurately, the solution will follow the same path. So the first thing that you can do is challenge every single thing that comes to you. The question everything approach helps you break down societal norms and assumptions to begin devising out of the box ideas. Imagine you're an architect trying to build a certain size driveway in a bungalow. Typically, you may state your challenge like this. There is no in not enough space for me to build this driveway. But challenging this assumption, you may instead ask a question like, what if I could create a way into the driveway into the back entrance of the bungalow? Or what if I reduce the entrance of the bungalow by one and a half feet? When you break down very, very, all the barriers preventing you from your success, you take the first step towards developing a brilliant solution. Another way to help you defining the problem is thinking of the inverse. Again, as product managers, we sometimes struggle to find the solution if the problem is defined in a very specific way. So many times we take the inverse of the problem and try to solve for that. For instance, a straightforward question is, how do you measure a success of the feature you're about to release? But the inverse could be, how do I know this feature has failed? What can I observe about the users? This feature has failed because the user has done X, Y, Z. Taking the inverse, I can actually learn how I may want to implement the success metric. So in your personal professional life, once you're able to get a basic deep dive into yourself, start defining the problem. Let's continue to build on the example of the user being unhappy at their job. 
After empathizing and gathering all the user insight, you may define the problem as some that maybe you're not as excited to go to the workplace anymore, or you may feel tired during work hours, or you may not have a good relationship with your coworkers. All of these problems do indicate that the user is unhappy at their job, but each of these problems have a very distinct and different solution from one another. So that is the step number two of, of defining the problem. Step number three is ideating on your solutions. In this phase, the goal is to let your mind run wild. As product managers, think of, we think of all the possible solutions, big, small, eccentric, eccentric, crazy, but the common thread tying them together is the fact that each idea solves a defined problem in some given capacity. When trying to implement this professionally or personally, having multiple solutions also really helps as it does as in your workplace. So maybe a few things that you can do is get a help, get help of all the people that you may know that can help you create a brainstorming session and ideate on a defined problem. Use some idea generation hacks, like maybe mind mapping or social listening, to just name a few. This is a very specific step in which I think system design as a concept can really take a, take a really big front seat. Usually in ideation, we get limited by solving the very specific defined problem and then that leads us to get an analysis paralysis. However, if we take the defined problem to be a part of the holistic system and our goal is to improve the system, the solution would go a much longer way. For instance, let's say you identified a problem in your level of fatigue and the solution was to ensure a nutritional balance in your body. Using your body as a system and then thinking of the solution or the remedy, you decide to adopt your, the, what you decide to adopt unintentionally doesn't ha harm other parts of the body. The next step is to prototype and test the MVP. As product managers, we prototype and test the minimum viable product, which ensures that the defined problem is solved with the highest impact and the lowest amount of tech lift. We also conduct user tests to get feedback on the prototype and establish a feedback loop with the ideation phase. Incorporating a feedback loop is another indication of the fact that this whole process is the creation of a system. Instead of just analyzing things on paper and having redundant conversation with stakeholders, we ensure that we ship out the quickest and the cheapest option with the feedback loop to the end user for us to learn from the prototype. This helps us get a very clear direction of what the next step has to be. We also end up A-B testing our prototypes to understand which version of the solution has the most impact. This involves splitting our groups into maybe one or two groups. And group A remains a control variation, which ends up seeing the existing flow of things, while group B is the new group which sees the new improved version of the group A solution. And let's say the problem that you defined was that you were not interested in the field that you were working in currently. In your ideation phase, you mainly ha may have identified a few possible solutions, for instance, and a quick prototype could have been something like interviewing people in a new field, shadowing someone who works in the field of your interest, or taking online courses to gauge your interest in the new field. If you did all of these things, you, would have, you could actually avoid the hard work and the risk of actually not liking what you end up switching to, and you end up learning a lot more about yourself before actually doing everything else. The happier you are and the further you can go into your prototype until you find a significant roadblock or a barrier. You can also A-B test different solutions on yourself on the, based on the data collected. You can actually do a rough power analysis to see how long this test should run for and how much impact can each solution carry forward. I think the final step that is not incorporated officially in any of these design phases is resilience and acceptance of failure. The only way to be innovative with feature releases and being comfortable with doing things that you've not done before is accepting the high possibility of failure. If you do not want to change something, continuing the same way will not let you bring about the change. Similarly, when you imbibe these principles in your day-to-day -day life, you must be comfortable with the risk of failing and not getting answers instantly. In one of the projects that I actually worked on recently, we shipped a very risky feature out that broke the entire site and did not allow our users to make payments. As you can imagine, that was mission critical for the existence of our site. But that failure helped me realize and reflect and analyze from what went wrong. I was able to come up with a playbook which had solutions of how to address this problem should it ever come up in the future. This, just, this did not just benefit me or my team, but it benefited the enti entire organization. And we were able to foolproof so many more risky projects from becoming failures. If I was afraid of failing and not shipping that project out, I would have never learned how to bounce back. 
And I want to end on this note saying that ultimately it is grit and resilience that sets winners apart and not just talent. Thank you.